nice to be back again. Was it two years ago that uh, you were in New Zealand? It was last year. Just last year? Last year I was in New Zealand. Oh wow, it seems longer. Yeah, I know, it's amazing. Time flies. And um, so it's wonderful to finally have you over here mm. in the States. And it's a pleasure. Getting to be with so many teachers and um, such a, it's such a really, really important opportunity for the so many teachers in the Pilates community to have the opportunity to really explore what do we mean by whole body? Because so often in Pilates, it's such a brilliant system and the genius, Joseph Pilates was such a genius of movement. Uh, and really he didn't, he didn't talk about anatomy. So what's been difficult as we've progressed with, uh, with the system is, uh, is that mostly cadaver-based anatomy systems have been um, taught through Pilates. And um, so that's, that's a lot of what most of us have studied mm -hmm. is, is cadaver-based anatomy. And that's what's interested me over the years is, uh, as I've studied more and more, what is whole body movement? How are we experiencing that? And how can we speak? How does that affect our cueing? The way that we speak uh, to people, the way we encourage um, people to think about themselves. So that's why I think your book is, uh, and the work that you're doing now is, is so important to um, really look at new ways of assessing, new ways of, of uh, understanding human movement and how we apply that to the depth of what we're doing. So I'd love to, I just wanted to thank you for yeah, it's a being here. Yeah. My two areas of, of importance that I think are particularly relevant to the Pilates community are the, what I call the archetypal postures, a different way of assessing, a different way of understanding movement generates over time a different way of assessing people. If your paradigm is this is a muscle, well then you train that muscle and you assess that muscle. If your paradigm is this is part of a big field of muscles, well then you start to move towards field-based assessment patterns. And over the years, I've, I think I've discovered a core sequence of postures that um, are the flip side of movement. They're resting postures. And I call them archetypal postures, and they're the sort of postures we're sitting in now. People have always sat on the floor. And particularly after movement, this is the way I think we should rest. All, you know, lots of variations on these postures and I'll be talking through over the next few days with you what those postures are, what, are, what I look for in the different postures, how I help clients into these postures, uh, using pillows, using cushions, um, they're meant to be easy postures so you prop people up so that they can rest in the posture. Um, the flip side of that is getting up from the floor. That I've come to believe is an essential movement sequence. It's right at the very core of being human. Because we, whatever the time period is, five or six million years ago, we stood up. And that standing up, that uh, moving away from a, an ape ancestor towards standing up, predates our, our big brains, our use of fire, our um, our language, our tools, and so standing up started the whole system. So standing up from the floor is probably the most important active sequence you can teach people. Uh, on top of that, then you teach everything else. But you know, for an animal that's derived from Homo erectus, to the standing up sequence is crucial. It's interesting how many people, as we get older, the tendency is to teach seniors exercises standing with a chair and doing a few little circles or how many, I, I look at so many senior exercises and they're really, they're actually not something that's even teaching people how to function well. It's just sort of stay alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that type of exercise, I'm sure it has a, a great social value and so on, but as far as 
teaching those people life skills, because sooner or later they will fall down. Right. And if you've gone through over and over again with them how to get up, and they've made that part of their life, well, I think, A, they're less likely to fall over, and B, when they do, they're more likely to stand back up. Um, so it's, it's a very important sequence. Easy to teach, easy to bring in the uh, Pilates community. And you've got good, firm furniture that people can use to help them down onto the floor. They can use to then lift back up from the floor. So very simple to bring these ideas into what you do. And what I've really noticed and become more and more aware of out of what you're speaking about is that until the feet open, really the hips can't open. Yeah. You know, you cannot squat down if your feet are not opening. Mm -hmm. You don't have that ability. Yeah, so again, the, the other side of my work is trying to model human movement. And uh, I think it's remarkable that we're in 2013. We've got so few models of, of movement. We, as, as a profession, and by that I mean everyone that deals with the moving body, we're still regional based in the way we try and understand movement. So we look at the individual joints or main patterns of movement, but we no one's tried to put it all together into a, a proper model that um, predicts human movement or that mimics human movement. So over the next few days, I'll be showing you what models are, why they're so important, um, the sort of skills you've got to bring to the table if you want to start modeling. And then I can show you how I've done it. it. I stress that it's a model, it's not the truth. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a first attempt to try and do it. But I've gone for, rather than cadaver based, I've gone for whole body patterns of movement. So I've gone back to crucial movement patterns. So I'm just going to use you for a, as a model for a second. Great. So if I could have you on all fours with your head facing that way. Okay. I'm going to show a couple of these patterns uh, on Wendy. So, um, we are a vertebrate. Vertebrates have a head end, they have a tail end. Uh, they're bilaterally symmetrical, so we've got a left and a right, and we've got a, a spine that's um, about two thirds of the way back through the body, so it's more back structure. All vertebrates, and this goes all the way back to fish. So, in a sense, we've got this body that. Um, it's still fish-like in some ways. And so bending to the side like this is a very, very old pattern of movement. So I can go through and show you which muscles do this and how your system patterns these fundamental movement sequences. Now, if Wendy was a fish, fish don't have necks. So when, let's bring the opposite of all your training. I want you to collapse your head into your shoulders. Okay, so we're going to get you right up like that. Great. Now that is the way a fish is. Okay. The fish, the shoulders here, attach into the base of the skull. Okay. So if Wendy was a fish, she'd be doing this sort of thing, because she can't do otherwise. And that then led to funny ways they use their eyes and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when we came out of the sea, we developed a neck. Okay. So now... When you can bend to the left, for example, and her head can go with that movement, or she can still bend to the left and her head can go back the other way, back that way. And this ability to go with the movement or away from the movement is mediated through the top of the neck. And so these are called writing reactions, and they're absolutely crucial to childhood development. Um, if you don't learn how to do this, you never get to sit up, you never get to then stand up. They're essential movement sequences. Relax. So, I've developed a model that shows how these muscles wrap around the system, how they're able to cross through the, through the neck, um, through the face, back the other way, and around like this, through the pelvic floor. So it's a big figure of eight that you can draw on people. And I can name the muscles and show you the borders and show you how it works. So that's one pattern of it. In a terrestrial environment, we started to, we meaning vertebrates, 
four-legged animals now. We started to experiment with flexion and extension. And it's the same sort of thing here. I can show you the muscles that are involved in this. Um, and how it's a big ring of muscle that goes right through the front and all the way around. So it's, it's now rings you like this. It's bilaterally symmetrical. So they're on either side of the midline, on the left and on the right. And <coughs> we can do, we can flex and we can separate and go into this movement. So these are this ability to separate your head from what your body is doing is again another one of these essential writing reactions. Okay, if you don't learn this as a kid, you don't stand up. And we can do the same if you're in extension, so you can take your head with that movement or you can separate your head and do the opposite. So, trying to work out which muscles, how, this, how we get from the, the back body to the front, and how we get from the front body around to the back to create this cross. Uh, in, in the jargon they call the cross a decussation, how to cross from the back to the front and from the front to the back. Um, and I can show you which muscles are involved with that and which are the primary muscles that uh, take you into these movements. Now, biomechanically, if I bend you to the side, and then I add some flexion or some extension, so one way or the other way. That then starts to twist the body. It's twisting, the ability to twist. So twisting might be if we could yeah, drop down. There's a twist, okay. This is a movement sequence that humans have really exploited more than any other animal on this planet. It's this ability to to counter-rotate our upper body on our lower body. Which, and we've used that in our walking pattern, in our walking gait, where we contra-twist. And we also use it in throwing. And uh, being here in the US, your whole country is absolutely ball mad. You know, if every place I've been to, to eat or drink, there's American football going on all the time. And it's throwing, 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 throwing. throwing is what our ancestors did for millions of years. That's how you brought your, your um, meat back to your family. You know, so throwing, the throwing skill, is a very, very important skill. And you do that through contra-rotating your upper body on your lower body. And see again, if I twist like this, my head can go that way or my head can go this way. If I want to throw accurately, I've got to twist my body one way but look the other way. If I do this, I've lost my dinner, it's disappearing. So this contra-rotation, again, we've got to be able to model how, go down Wendy, so if Wendy's in a twist, how these muscles, you can work, how these, these big twists wrap around the physique and, and how muscular tissue's got to cross from one side of the body to the other side and from the front to the back and from the top to the bottom. So how do we start to understand the body's ability to do this? And have you come, how many times have you got to wrap muscular tissue around the, the body to create what we know humans can do? And if you get a, a flexible Pilates person, yoga person, you put them in the most complex twist you can imagine, how, how many times do you have to cross the midline to create those patterns? And so I've given some thought to the theory of that, how we, we cross. Another key pattern uh, that wraps its way through all of this, I don't call it core strength, I think that's not the way to, to see this, is a the longitudinal integrity of the spine is a crucial um, need of your spine. If you lift something or do a bad movement and you kink your spine, even for a second, uh, you can pinch one of those discs and then you're in trouble for months. It takes a long time to recover from a pinched disc. Uh, so our system has got a, an ability to squeeze like this. 
Okay, so it's not just here, but it's the whole system, right from the pelvic floor all the way through, 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 and I'd suggest right up into the mouth. Um, and it's this ability to both squeeze and dilate. We use the dilation for uh, breathing, and we use the dilation for digesting. If you've had a big meal, you want to let all this relax, and you want to to um, go into relaxation mode. If you're lifting something heavy, well, then you want to go into squeezing mode, okay? Because you want to brace yourself. And so I've worked out how that works. What where the top of that system is and where the bottom of that system is and how I can um, show you which muscles are involved in that and um, this is not, I stress this is not a deep or a core system in my view of looking at bodies uh, muscles warp and weft like a textile so down here a muscle is deep but later on that muscle will rise to the surface and become superficial and this is very clear with this um, pattern. I also expect muscle to widen and to narrow, widen and narrow as it works its way through the physique. And um, <coughs> that's just the way the system works. Thank you, Wendy. We better. Ooh. That was so, great. Yeah, it was great to feel um, the different fields as you were you know, mm. describing them. It, it's a complex model mm -hmm. when you, because they're layers and layers, we've got to put the arms and the legs into it. And then I would suggest you've got to start going down into the guts. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to link, we only move because we want to take our face, our hands, our feet or our genitals somewhere in space. That's what movement is all about. So to have a pattern of movement without reference to these organs doesn't make any sense to me. So in each field I embed a sense organ. And uh, it takes me a few days to talk, talk through why I thought this was important. I got my cue for this idea from acupuncture. Because in acupuncture they as I started to understand what they were mapping with their meridian system 2,000 years ago, they would run their lines on very particular parts of the body and they would point to specific sense organs you know, quite clearly. And when I realized what they were actually trying to tell me, that's when I first made that insight that um, in, a, in a field of movement, you place, or for, for hundreds of millions of years, the sense organs have been associated on vertebrates with very particular parts of the body. Always have been. So the fields of, of movement, of contractility, have co-evolved with the sense organs. Well, that's, that's the idea. That's, that's the model. But anyway, it takes me a few days to talk you through it. I look forward to doing that over the next three days. When it's and very I, excited. And it's great that you've um, brought me over, and I, I look forward to doing my, my best for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you.